I don't go to uh, the devil to play the devil. I think make, many actors make that mistake. Go to God to tell you who the devil is. That's what I do. And it also gives me a protection. What's the um, difference? What's the difference, Jim? Like Because that also bears on how you protect yourself from such things. Um, the different, the, uh, and are you saying um, the difference in the, the difference is, is that I, I play the truth. So if you go and play, go to the devil to play the devil, the devil will deceive you and put something up there that uh, deceives the public. He'll always try to hide in the shadow. He'll always try, because he doesn't like the light, even though he's called the light, the illuminator, um, the uh, uh, Lucifer. Um, and he tries to mimic God. He tries to be like God. So there's always like, um, the, if God has love, and what we see as love, he creates lust. He's always trying to be like that. It's like uh, Cain trying to rip off Abel, cutting the corners. And um, so committing to... There's, well, there's a tendency, even in Milton's, uh, in, in, in Milton's Paradise Lost, there's been two readings of that forever. And one of them is that Milton's Satan is um, an, an anti-hero of the most profound sort, really the embodiment of evil. And the other reading is that um, Milton's Satan is a, a disguised hero and the eternal, what would you say, the eternal rebel against established order and someone to emulate in consequence, and that Milton somehow knew that and was coding that, not precisely secretly, but subtly. And I think that's a huge mistake. I mean, I've familiarized myself with Paradise Lost, and I think that Milton was an extraordinarily subtle writer and that he got everything as right as anyone ever has. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because, so this is, okay, this is a complicated thing to untangle, but one of the things you see in Hollywood portrayals of villains, you saw this in The Silence of the Lambs, you see it frequently in mafia portrayals, is that the villain is inadvertently or even sometimes purposefully glorified. And it's partly because he's a rule breaker and, and has the attraction that goes along with that. But I also wonder too, if it's it has something to do with what you were describing, is that the writers and the actors find themselves, when they're trying to portray evil, pulled towards falseness in that representation as part of the proclivity of evil to hide itself. And the danger in that is twofold, and one is the danger of deceiving the public as to the true nature of evil, because there's nothing heroic about it, quite the contrary. And the second danger I wonder about, you know, there's all this speculation about Heath Ledger and the consequences that for him of having played the Joker in such a dark manner. And, you know, I don't know what to make of that, although I do think there is some danger in having to journey down a path of emulating evil in order to represent it. Now, you said that you turned to God, so to speak, to protect yourself against false representations of evil, but also in some ways to shield yourself. And it sounds to me reminiscent of what Tim's uh, superiors mentioned to him when they said to him that his faith might protect him I from, love his question. from what was... Okay, go ahead, ma'am. This is the best interview I've ever had in my life. I love your line of questioning and um, getting to what what is real. My job uh, is to give what I know to be absolutely certain and real. I hooked into Tim has a childlike quality to him, and I stay with that innocence and that and don't take that innocence as weakness. Or, uh, and um, so. When I read the scripture, I, I feel truth, good, evil, and I find the good, and let that just pierce the darkness. And it has to pierce. And I know what that light is. And I know that deception that, that when I start hearing about, for example, in, in your life, when you th there's two masters here. One is from the evil, wicked side, but he comes in through your ego. And the other one is the light side that tells you might, what you might not want to hear, but you ought to hear. And it's not manipulative. It's truth. So I, f I go to that side. Then I pray. Then I go through it. Like the Passion of the Christ, I looked at the Shroud of Turin. And there were two men, Christian Tinsley 
and Keith Vanderlyn, who are experts in makeup. And the first, both of these men were agnostic. And they looked at the shroud that Mel Gibson presented to them. And one particular way, the way it is uh, through the negative, however they were able to show it, you can see the track lines of Jesus. You can see the 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 actual um, bamboo sticks that they used to, to initially hit him. And then you see the cat of nine tails, the track lines. They look like the Grand Canyon in your skin. And it shocked them. Now, these guys look at everything from decapitations, murders, and everything. Prior to this, I did a movie a long time ago in New York, and I was with Homicide, and I got to see uh, the contortion of a face when someone gets murdered, and it's hard to watch. But when you start going into this, which is children, there is something that I can't even fathom, even with the protection of Almighty God, because it took me two years to get over this. Two years, and a friend of mine, Debbie, came into the room, and at around three o'clock in the middle of the night, she I was in a chair, and she heard me just weeping. Now, I would go into these black holes, and I have no idea. I don't remember it, but this was all of the screaming that I had to hear. I didn't want to hear it, but I had to hear it. And then I was able to transform that into the movie that you just saw when I took asked Alejandro Monteverdi to move the, to our, our DP to take it and show him my eyeball so you would see a 20-foot eye to see what Tim goes through to rip his heart out. Now, it's not like uh, this is what I want to experience any more than I want to get on a cross and have uh, my heart broken. I went through hypothermia. Uh, I had to have open-heart surgery. I was electrocuted, struck by lightning. I understand the, the the necessity of what I was going to have to go through could help bring people back to God, to wake them up. And quite frankly, more people now, Jordan, are more afraid of the devil than they are of God because they want a happy Jesus. And the problem is, is that eventually, Jordan, we all are going to die. Eventually, that that is going to happen. But people, the, the the power of the devil deceives to say, no, no, you're going to be around for a long, long time. And, and they never wake up. And eventually there is a judgment and then you have to decide or God decides not how you want to see yourself anymore, but how God sees you and how God sees you is who you really are. And so that is how I uh, chose to, to go at this particular case. I had no choice but to go in. And I hear the screams in my heart. I hear the screams because of the agents that I got to work with, got to show me things. And they, one particular time, he says, are you sure you want to go further? But I was weeping so hard. I said, this is what Tim goes through. This is what I got. I got to see it in order to go into there to, to take people to a level to, of, will you do something? Will you do something? At some point, it ends for all of us. And so the pain in my heart is much better than the pain in the future, and if I have to see that to save my children, to motivate me to save my niece, to tell my sister, no, walking home at 13 years old from school is not a good choice. Not a good choice, my sister says to me. No, I want my sister, my daughter, excuse me, to have the same kind of experience I have. And I said, no, not until this changes. You need to understand. So Anne, my sister, is a good, mo great mother, but she wasn't aware because the media that's supposed to do a good job to tell the truth, well, they're going into that direction, which is let's kind of twist it and change it and not talk about it. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like not paying attention to the safety demonstration on a flight. Most of the time, you'll probably be fine. But what if one day that weird yellow mask drops down from overhead and you have no idea what to do? It's better to be safe than sorry. Every time you connect to an unencrypted network, cafes, hotels, airports, any hacker on the same network can gain access to your personal data, such as your passwords and financial details. It doesn't take much technical knowledge to hack someone, just some cheap hardware. Hackers can make up to $1,000 per person selling personal info on the dark web. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet. Hackers cannot steal your sensitive data. I love ExpressVPN for how easy it is to use. I just fire up the app and click one button to get protected. 
Stop letting strangers invade your online privacy by visiting expressvpn.com slash jordanyt. That's expressvpn.com slash jordanyt and get three extra months free. expressvpn.com slash jordanyt. How has this changed you? How is how is experiencing that material and having to play it out changed you? I, I I'd give my life in a heartbeat. Changed me. I, I'm less concerned about myself than I am about the, the hurting. I I will tell you this right now. I would absolutely die if this if this were to change the world and get rid of trafficking and pornography and all of the, the eight arms of this octopus that has to be destroyed. The only way you can destroy it is take the head out. If that hit, I'd give my life for it in a heartbeat.